I'm Officer Yehoshua with Israel United in Christ with a very important message to the people of the Solomon Islands. Now you may or may not have known that the history that has occurred to your people actually matches Bible prophecy. And I want to share that with you today. So let's start off by examining a scripture. We're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 15. And it reads, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now let's examine one of those curses. We're going to read verse 33. And it says, the fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. So who was that nation that you didn't know that came to the Solomon Islands and oppressed the people of the Solomon Islands and colonized the Solomon Islands? That was the British. In 1893, the British came to the Solomon Islands and declared it a British state. But who is it even until this day? Not only was it the British in times past, but even now the United States of America. So now what I'd like to do is let's examine an article so that we can compare how history of the past and events of the present continue to fulfill Bible prophecy. World War II is still killing people in the Solomon Islands. Coconut crabs roast atop a sheet of roofing iron. Now, coconut crabs are unlawful according to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 9 on down. Nevertheless, heated by a fire below as the Manali family prepares for a typical Monday night dinner in Guadalcanal. Standing next to the fire which has been set at the foot of the stairs leading up to the house, John Manali, a substance farmer, chats with his sons. 13-year-old Junior Dominic and 17-year-old Jeffrey as the sun goes down. A few yards away, Loretta Manley, the boy's mother, fixes the rest of the meal next to the family's traditional thatched hut kitchen. The cooking fire snaps. It cracks again, then it explodes. The blast hurls the four Manleys off the ground, sending them flying. The blazing airborne metal mangles John and Junior. John dies where he lies. Junior in a hospital two hours later. So what we're going to do, we're going to further dissect this article and its history regarding World War II to find out how World War II and the U.S.'s impact on the Solomon Islands actually fulfills Bible prophecy. But let's continue to read. Now we can see pictures of Jeffrey Manley. It says he's now 18, bears the scars and memories of a blast that killed his father and younger brother. The bomb was suspected to have come from World War II. So we see that he looked like he had a big hole in the middle of his chest, close to his lungs. Uh, this is crazy, all right? So we're gonna jump down a little bit. Every year, researchers estimate more than 20 people are killed or seriously injured when one of the thousands of unexploded World War II era bombs left behind by the US and Japan is set off. We'll skim down a little more. It says explosive remnants of war have plagued the Solomon Islands since Japan, the US and its allies withdrew from the fighting in the mid 1940s after World War II, leaving a deadly legacy the developing South Pacific nation has been unable to deal with despite its pleas for help. Now, what I'd like to explain to you is the significance of why America would choose to come to the Solomon Islands in the midst of war. Now, when we go back to the book of Genesis, we read about a man named Esau, a red, hairy man that liked to be outside. He was a cave dweller eventually, but let me read you another characteristic of Esau, actually his blessing from his father. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 27, 
starting at verse, I'm gonna start at verse 38. It says, and Esau said unto his father, hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. So what is the fatness of the earth? The fatness of the earth are the best places on earth, the nicest places to live, the places with the richest resources. So when we examine the South Pacific, yes, we can find the, the fatness of the earth in the South Pacific. So first and foremost, Esau would find his way to the South Pacific because that is a very rich land, rich in resources, rich in culture, especially in the Melanesian area. But let's read on. And of the dew of heaven from above, and by thy sword shalt thou live. So when it says Esau would live by the sword, what is that sword going into? War. Esau would live by war. So it's no coincidence that this same man and his descendants have made it to the fatness of the earth in the South Pacific, and not only so, but have done so in the midst of war. So that is a very significant point that we must examine and understand, thus saith the Lord. So let's continue reading in the article. It says, earlier this year, hundreds of dignitaries, including the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, and Caroline Kennedy, U.S. Ambassador to Australia, were sent to the Solomon Islands to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the first U.S. Marine Corps landing at Guadalcanal. The 1942 arrival of U.S. forces marked a turning point in Allied efforts to repel Japan's southern advance in the Pacific, eventually leading to its defeat. So the article says that they commemorated the 80th anniversary of the Marine Corps showing up in the Solomon Islands. So all of these scriptures and all of this history further proves that the Bible is a true book. Genesis 27 told us that Esau would live by the sword and he'd take that sword to the fatness of the earth. Let me show you another scripture that says the exact same thing. This is the book of Micah chapter two, verse two, and it reads, and they covet fields, fields goes into lands, and take them by violence. What was the violence? The violence was World War II. And houses, and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house. What did we just read about? We read about bombs being left under a man's house that caused that man and one of his sons to be put to death by that bomb exploding. Even a man and his heritage. Part of the heritage now of the Solomon Islands is you got random bombs all over the place. And at any given point, you could step on it, you can be cooking out on the grill, and boom, now your life is gone, all right? Further proving that the Bible is a real book. All right, so now we see here, we see the pictures of the two brothers that were killed by America and Japan's bombs that they left in somebody else's land. The pride of these people to do such a thing. So on the left side, we see Dominic says, 13 was in fifth grade and dreamed of becoming a pilot for Solomon Airlines. His life was taken from him because America wanted to set up a base to fight a war that had nothing to do with the Solomon Islands. And on the right, we see his father, John Manley, 44, did everything he could around the farm to scrape together enough money for his education. All right, so this is the last segment of the article I'd like to share with you. It says, Loretta described how shrapnel tore straight through her husband's chest, killing him almost instantly. Other family members explained how his lower leg was torn from its socket. She was knocked to the ground by the blast. I couldn't move, I was in shock, Loretta says. I thought, Jesus, what happened? Now I want to talk about that last statement that was made just a little bit more. Now I'm saddened by your losses and my condolences for the family members that passed away. But the sister said, Jesus, 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 what happened? Now typically when our people call upon that name, Jesus, there's an image that's associated in their minds and there's deep down in their subconscious. And that image 
is of the same people that came and colonized you in 1893, or of the same people that showed up in the 1940s to build military bases and things for World War II. But what does the Bible say about Jesus? Well, I'm gonna tell you right now. It doesn't say that he's a white man. And I wanna show you who this person that you're calling upon looks like according to his own book. So let's go to Revelation chapter one, verse 14, to find out what did Jesus Christ look like. The book of Revelation, chapter one, I'm gonna start at verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, who are we talking about? Jesus the Christ, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So he had a long, a long garment on with a girdle around his waist. Now it's gonna describe what he physically looked like. Verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool. Hmm. Now who on this earth has woolly textured hair? Well, I challenge you to go look in the mirror, people of the Solomon Islands, and I guarantee you that you have hair just like wool, just like Christ, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet, what's on his feet? Skin. What is that skin on his feet connected to? The rest of the skin on the rest of his body. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. If Christ had skin that looked like brass burned in a furnace, how do you get a white man out of that? That white man with his hands folded, looking up in the sky, that's not in the Bible. In the Bible, you find a black man, a dark skinned black man. And that's what you must understand and see when you read the word of God. Let me give you another example. Now we all know that Jesus Christ is the lion from the mighty tribe of Judah, right? But let's read it out of the Bible. The book of Hebrews chapter seven, verse 14. It says, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah. Now follow me here, I wanna show you something about the tribe of Judah. Let's see what the tribe of Judah look like. We're gonna to go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 14, we're gonna read verse two. It says, Judah, the same tribe that Christ came from, mourneth and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. So if the tribe of Judah is black, and Jesus Christ is from the tribe of Judah, what would that make Christ? There you have it, you're on to something. Jesus Christ is a black man. That's exactly right. I'm gonna show you another one. I'm gonna flip over, book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse five. Explaining Christ again, it says, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a certain man, who's that man? Jesus Christ, clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphrates. His body also was like the beryl. So the garment, the clothing that he had on his body, it was green, beryl is a, a shade of green. And his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms, listen good, and feet, like in color to polished brass. What is polished brass? The same thing we just read in Revelation 1 and 14 and 15. Burned brass. And the voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. So there you have it. My brothers and sisters of the Solomon Islands, the history that your people have suffered matches the prophecy of the Bible to prove that you are the Israelites according to the Bible. And I'll leave you with this. Jesus Christ is a black man according to the Bible. And the so-called white man is the devil. Shalom.